Welcome, Spartans, to Halo TV Plus, part of Evolved, your home for Halo. I'm your host, Oren, and on Halo TV Plus, my guests and I recap Halo's original television show, Halo the Series, and discuss its content and unique canon within the Silver Timeline. Joining me again to discuss Season 2's finale, Episode 8, Halo, is Nathan. Welcome back to the show, Nathan. Thanks so much. I We have a lot to cover, uh, so we are just going to dive straight into our housekeeping so then we can get to it, but what an episode this was. I really enjoyed rewatching it with you and talking about it. It was just very exciting. Just so much to say. Absolutely. If you're a returning listener, you already know this, but thank you for joining. Halo TV Plus produces two podcast episodes to accompany each Halo the Series episodes. This is the analysis episode where in a moment, Nathan and I will highlight key scenes from the episode Halo that we believe need further analysis, which is basically the whole episode. Uh, We will discuss characters, motivations, uh, choices that the showrunners made, where we left off at the end of the season, and so on and so on. Earlier this week, we released our commentary episode, where we discussed the whole episode while watching it. If you missed it, we recommend listening to that episode first before listening to this, but it's ultimately up to you. Halo TV Plus is part of Evolved that hosts other Halo podcast shows like Podcast Evolved, HCS Pro Talk, Mission Debrief, Builds of Blocks, and Halo Book Club. You can learn more about each of those shows on our website, evolvedhalo.co or halopodcast.com. Evolved also hosts another show called I Would Have Been Your Podcast, which is a Patreon-exclusive podcast for our subscribed patrons. If you are not a patron and want to learn more and what it means to be a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash haloevolved to learn more. Patrons receive a variety of exclusive rewards, such as early episodes, access to our original 18-song soundtrack, unique swag, access to our private Discord channel, and more. Shout out to our current subscribers. Thank you guys so, so much for supporting the show every single week. You allow us to keep going and to branch out on multiple platforms as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Now, I missed the little synopsis, so to kind of just lead us in to our first topic. The synopsis of Halo is the climactic battle for the Halo begins. John makes a fateful choice. Soren and Quan undertake a rescue mission. Halsey and Miranda unleash an ancient horror season finale. It was directed by Denny Gordon, a runtime of 54 minutes and 4 seconds, and it originally aired on March 21st, 2024. All right, Nathan, we have a lot to talk about. So many things happen in this episode. Where should we begin? I think we should probably start with the flood because that was kind of the biggest kind of not surprise, but I think one of the most important plot points of this episode, just with knowing the core canon lore and and how big of a, a, a thing that the flood is. If you had told me when we started season two that we were going to end with the flood in this season, I would have been shocked. Um, so it's kind of cool that we've gotten that far and going to get closer to really having the characters understand what the halos are for. So I think we should probably start with, with, with the flood. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good starting point. That kind of makes the most sense now that I think about it. So uh, yeah, speaking to your point of if we knew from the get-go, I think I even talked with my first host, which I'm, I'm blanking on, was either maybe Steve or Colin uh, or no, I think it might have been Ian was episode one. I'm not I'm not sure because we I did both of them back to back because they released the same week. But mm-hmm. there was a conversation when, when Quan talks at the end of the episode and she she mentions the monster. And I was talking with whoever that host was and it was like, yeah, is she referring to the covenant or is she talking about the flood? But like we had no inkling of an idea of the flood at that point of the show. And now to kind of see it come all the way back around to that actually being what she's referring to and that is what is released and it's here and it's a and a present threat yeah it is a little surprising and and um, i'm i'm it had to happen at some point right like like you said the flood is a critical part of the halo canon and and really the the basis for the existence of the halo rings so it is natural that the show would touch upon it so it yeah, I guess uh, we, we talked about it a little bit in the commentary, but how did you, did you, you said that you, you enjoyed the interpretation of the Flood sort of being 
brought into the show. You just kind of wish it was a little bit more gruesome and and it was kind of less human, more flood type of a uh, visual, more like the games. You want to expand on that at all? Yeah, like I feel like the the parts where I I liked the flood scenes the most were the parts like in the in the jail cell where there's like tentacles sprouting out of necks and you know like that kind of level of just like essentially when the host becomes unrecognizable <laughs> like that's kind of what it is yeah. in the games right that's like, a good you, way to put it like like you're never like you're never in the games being chased by things that look mostly human like with the flood like most of the time they're warped or they have weird you know they're running really strangely and i think this episode obviously you know the budget's part of it but i think part of it is their interpretation of the flood especially in its kind of earlier stages which i think most of the people that we see like in the room with parangoski and with halsey they're pretty early like they're losing control of their behavior and they're becoming really violent but they're not that deformed like even the scene where parangoski is being essentially looks like eaten alive by the other people it it just looks like a bunch of marines and oni people that are have a couple weird looking moles on their face and they're getting really angry like yeah they have like a boil or some sort of rash and yeah going ballistic yeah yeah so i think i think the visual parts with the tentacles and with you know that kind of level of deformity is when it felt most like the flood to me otherwise it felt more like zombies and and i i think like you know lara getting you know bit or halsey getting bit it just it's not how the flood is transmitted in in the games like the flood is transmitted by being attacked by an infection form and then your body gets taken over from the inside out like through your spinal cord and takes over your nervous system um but that's not always how the flood's been in, like in the lore. Like there is instances, like I talked about in the commentary, where you know ancient humanity, ancient forerunners, they were you know exposed to it in the dust form, right? Um, and, right. And we and then they were eating the animals, and the animals were behaving strangely, and then the humans started behaving strangely. So there is precedent for that. But um, yeah, it's just different than maybe what I was expecting like i think seeing the infection forms like in the mouths and the eyes and you know that was really gross and that's when it really felt like the flood and i think seeing it more like we didn't also have a moment where we heard like a collective grave mind voice behind the flood i think that would make it kind of to the non-halo fans that are just watching the show for the first time it would have separated it from a zombie show if they had heard oh, this thing has, like, a collective hive mind. Like, that, I don't think that was brought out quite as as much as it could have been. Yeah, I think Halsey might have just kind of briefly talked about it or or alluded to that. Yeah, like, it's forming a collective... It doesn't explicitly say it, and... And I and I still think that there there's definitely time to explore some of that. Hundred percent. I think the way it was just introduced in this episode, though, could have they could have pushed the envelope further for sure. I think we can say that about almost everything about this show. Um, you know, maybe maybe ninety percent of the show could have been pushed a little bit in the Halo direction more. But yeah, to your point, like I I agree that when the humans are more deformed it just kind of gave us a little bit more of that yes this is the flood creeped us out a little bit more the kind of mannerism and twitching and and neck neck whips that the actors were kind of (laughs) doing uh really sold to like that this you know thing is taking over their body um and yeah i i hope down the line we get to the point where you know instead of it being a kind of a marine with like a tentacle it's like this this body of deformity and we get like a little bit of the uniform showing through mm-hmm. kind of, it's kind of a little bit more close to what like the the game models are mm-hmm. so yeah i i have a lot of optimism for for where kind of they can take this and now that yeah. it's in the universe they can then expand on it yeah i think my biggest question is like Okay, it's fine that they're doing the flood on Onyx, even though that's not part of the core, because we know this is its own timeline. But like, now we have a flood-infested surface of a shield world, and I think that they could still do 
the shield world thing because they saw the forerunner city like it's definitely still possible for them to go back and and you know my thought was you know is this going to turn into like onyx being destroyed like it is in the books and that will wipe out the flood there i don't know but it's it's um it's definitely interesting to have the flood on a different planet than the ring because now if there's going to be flood on the ring we're going to have flood in two different lo- 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 two different locations and we'll have to figure out how to deal with that yeah and i th- i feel like we could utilize those that's that city that they introduced in the last episode as like a refuge or something or that's where they go to learn more about the flood because mm-hmm. I, th- I think miranda is really the only character left on onyx i guess Anne halsey who's in a cryo tube but you know, Soren and Ackerson, Quan and Kessler, they all get off. Liara and and uh, Parangoski get killed, so they are they join the Grave Mind and the Flood and all that. So yeah, Miranda's in a she's in a pickle right now. So it, we'll have yeah. to wait and see what happens to her. Yeah, I that was definitely a big cliffhanger and something that I can't. Yeah, like, how could she get out? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, unless Sentinels arrive or something, right? But I, it, it's, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where they go with her for sure. Yeah, actually, that, I completely didn't even think of that, but that's that's true. There could be some sort, because the Sentinels get deployed when there's an outbreak on the Halo as a, yep. as a means to clean everything up. So that could be Onyx's protocol, being that it is a shield world, and that... Yeah, that would that'd be very interesting. That's a pretty good thought. And it's like the eagles are coming, except it's the sentinels. <laughs> yeah, it's the sentinels. <laughs> the sentinels are coming. <laughs> yeah, but no, but no. Overall, like like I said before, not having thought that we were gonna get this far into the flood, uh, even though it could be better, I think it's still awesome that we got it this season and it wasn't just like a tease for next season like it went there and it didn't have to i agree very much so yeah i'm glad they 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 just say hey we're gonna we're not gonna tease the flood we're gonna give you the flood and yep. it left you know they kind of teased this last episode so to speak so uh no i very much agree i think it and it really delivered um what i wanted to touch on is in the commentary episode we we talked about halsey so miranda in Thermopylae said a line that you brought up where she said, you know, wherever you don't go, I will to, to that extent. Uh, kind of mm-hmm. meaning that if, if you're not around or if you're doing, if you get stuck somewhere, I will go past and beyond and continue your work. And, and kind of the last few episodes of Miranda and Halsey's relationship kind of seemed to be a, a little bit more on the healthier side. Mm-hmm. She keeps calling her mom. Yeah, she called her mom a few times, uh, which which is big for for Miranda. And so Halsey gets gets infected, and she gets thrown into a cryo tube, and Halsey or um, and Miranda basically says, you know, this will slow down your your infection, and I won't stop, and I will save you. Um, just give me time. So that's kind of looting her to find a cure. And I, I feel like that's kind of a typical thing to say if anyone was really in this sort of predicament. But as we know in Core Cannon, there isn't a cure. The only sort of inkling of a cure that we have is Sergeant Johnson, who is effectively immune. But that's just because the flood senses his like cancer. And so it's not right. anything that he has. It's just they don't want to infect a like weak host i guess is you know or an ill host so do you want to talk about that anymore like do you think that's a path that's miranda's going to kind of kind of go down like do we do we see halsey again or is this kind of a way to kind of write her out for a season or so i don't know like i once once i saw that she got infected i was like wait what I just don't know how they'll get out of it. Like, if there is a cure for the flood in this universe, then the halos are irrelevant. Yeah. Like, the whole point of the flood is that there is no cure, and the only thing that you can do is to kill everything in the universe. So I think Miranda is like, I think there's there's probably a cure I'm going to try, but like... Yeah, she's probably optimistic. Yeah, like, and so what do they do? Do they do they wake her up and cut out that part of her neck and try and, like, 
stop it from spreading or like do they wake her up and I don't know but it, it was definitely a shock to have Halsey be infected by the flood um because that is just something that is so yeah just extremely different than what I was expecting and I, I'd be just very curious to see how they're going to handle it there's no frame of reference for it <laughs> yeah <laughs> no you're right you're right it, I think it's her kind of just being optimistic is kind of how I interpreted it. Yeah. Because that's kind of what I feel like you would do in that situation. You know, almost like Soren, when he saw Liera's infection, he, he was like, we can fix this. It's like, that's yeah. kind of the natural sort of response. You you don't want to accept what the reality is, is that yeah. that leads to to death and all that. So, yeah, yeah I, I wish we got more of Miranda just earlier in the season. So, I... I I kind of like the prospect of her having a little bit more of a critical role dealing with the flood and, and maybe trying to find this cure or just being in Onyx because I think there's a lot to be discovered about Onyx that the show hasn't really tapped into that mm. Miranda can kind of be the vessel for. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of like how that was being framed. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Now that I think of it, though, I wonder if there could have been even just like like if here's how I think I think we'll we'll get to the monitor stuff near the end, but there could have been more. I think even like a one liner that connects the fact that Halo is the solution for the flood, because in the show they know that Halo is is a weapon. That's all that they know. I think there could have been like a I don't know how they could have done it, but it could have helped the viewers. Because, you know, I have friends of mine that are not fans of Halo and they're just watching the show and they're like, what the heck is the Halo? And they still don't know. And even by the end of this season, we still don't know what the Halo is. Um, and if they were doing like a flash forward, it could have been almost that moment where Cortana was like, oh no, oh no, no, no. Like, this is not just a weapon. This is meant like, you know what I mean? Like something like that, that, that could have kind of explained that. Yeah, that would have been interesting. Because I think for people that are not Halo fans, they still have no idea what a Halo is just based off of the show, beside that it's a weapon. Right. Well, I mean, we don't really learn what the Halo is until halfway through the game when yeah, Connor ex- explains it after she gets uploaded. So I, I feel like I would want to see more of Chief and Cortana learning about it instead of just like an end episode sticker. But hopefully Mm -hmm. now that they're actually on the ring, that can be something that is explored and they can go into the depths of the ring and see what it is. And Cortana can learn what she learns. And then they're dealing with the flood of it all. And McKee is this constant force of wanting to activate because i mean mckee is basically the prophets at this point yeah they were kind of missing this season yeah they were not in the season really at all and so she is the window character to the covenant of someone who wants to complete the great journey Mm -hmm. we'll kind of just have to wait and see i guess do we think that the prophets were on the fleet that was chasing mckee um we could they could be yeah we might have gotten a, a scene of that of them wanting to pursue that yeah i think actually there's like a very momentary shot i it's definitely possible and that would that would allow the prophets to then be on the ring and still be kind of this prophety leader leading the covenant around and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so yeah very that's very much a possibility because mm-hmm. i think like i said in the commentary we do see a glimpse of the ships entering the atmosphere and so it you know, the occupation of the ring is is kind of next. Right. Of uh, both forces setting up their respective strongholds and supports and everything else in between. And then Atriox forms the Banished, and then we have three factions and the, and the Flood. No, I'm just well, yeah, yeah, then before, yeah, four factions. Yeah, that'd be, oof, oh boy. That's funny. Atriox was it, was it in season one, so. Yeah, it, it, yeah through the... Through the subtitles, anyway. So it's uh, yeah. He can he can very well be the the new arbiter, so to speak, since the arbiter was killed. Ooh, that's interesting. Hmm. Well, to circle back to the flood a little bit, I I want to talk about Quan and the mother. We we've been hinting at this for a few episodes now. When I talked about it with Krista on the Alaria episode, and when you and I talked about it on this episode. It seems that this mother character is like a Gaosh to Quan as as like a 
an ancient human that has imprinted themselves into current modern humans and they're able to speak through them with the histories of ancestors and things like that and they yeah sort of kind of set that up in season one with Quan, but it again it just hasn't been really explained well at all and this episode it, that mother character is the one that actually says the word flood and kind of says what these beings are in a pseudo crypto cryptic way uh and so we've, I, I just want them to just push that more uh, because I feel like that wasn't pushed enough. And that's part of my frustration and maybe other people's frustration with Quan throughout the whole season was that she her first interaction with this character is halfway through the episode where at, and, and she hears of these stories of the monster and and is in the cave with the stars and all that. And she knows of it so i feel like you can allude that she's been visited by ancestors maybe not this certain character because she seemed she was like who are you and all that kind of stuff in the Ilaria episode but like i feel like if we had the mother character appear in the first episode through kwan i think it would have been even more shocking because we saw her die at the beginning of the episode with chief on sanctuary and then also see her talking with kwan it would really be a head scratcher. And I feel like that would have helped Quan's motivation of like w- being scared of the monster and trying to find a purpose and doing all these other type of things. And I, f- I feel like that's a very easy fix now that we know the story that they're really trying to tell with this kind of big reveal at the end. Yeah, I definitely feel like Quan's plot has been one of the weaker ones this season and it could have done more like I think it's interesting that she's kind of the tie to this this ancient humanity gene songy thing I still have so many questions like you know why it seemed to me that this mother character was a real person on sanctuary for starters like everyone saw her it wasn't like it was a vision like chief saw her the marines saw them because they're like chief they don't want to leave like they were visible to everyone on sanctuary um, but then whenever Quan sees her, it seems to be someone that only she can see, like on a Larry at the fire, right? So is it like, yeah, and to me, it, are they maybe doing it that like, whereas in, in the mainline lore, everyone has a different gene song, like, you know, Chief might have this guy or, you know, um, different people have different sort of different humans within them. But in this show, could it just be that like, she is the representative for everyone like she represents ancient humanity and that's why multiple people have seen her um i don't know or are they like i said are they gonna make humans and forerunners sort of you know related again like they were alluding to in the bungee days um because there was that door where halsey and miranda are underneath and they said in this one they had the genes of humans and this one they had the genes of forerunners and so are they you know yeah i don't know where they're gonna go with it but it's it's interesting that they're they're not touching on some of the more like basic halo lore things but they're jumping into gene songs like that's <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's like that's a lot right and, and it's very cool that is the very hard sci-fi aspects of the whole forerunner mythology yeah like we didn't do that for the first five halo games right like halo one to three odst and reach had nothing to do with that it was a very three four three halo four thing to do which is fine but yeah, it's just interesting that they're jumping that far into the nitty gritty of the ancient history of stuff, but it's interesting. Yeah, I just feel like they could have laid a few more breadcrumbs. Yes, to kind of allow us to care about Quan a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Because I I can't speak for the whole community, but I and if you listen to this all the other episodes of this podcast, I had a very up and down feeling with Quan throughout the whole season. I was fighting for her. I wanted to like her, but I just couldn't and got frustrated with her on one of the episodes, our last episode, actually, when she... Like, like just imagine if, like, all you needed was that mother character to say, like, like you know which one. Like, Quan can be looking at the thing, and then that, that mother character is going to be like, all she can say is, you know which one. 
and then she she picks it and then it's like okay so there there's some sort of connection there that we we want but we had no context and so it's just it i just think she that 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 woman that character and actress should have just been peppered in a few more times and that would also help justify kwan's like could justify her assassins it can justify her gun skills and like yeah. how she can drag vanek <laughs> across the yeah, ice she has you know uh yeah. so it's yeah that's kind of this episode does help but i feel like there's still work to be done to make Quan. but i i think there's there's been some steps in the right direction yeah absolutely so lastly we have uh, Parangoski and Liara, there are two victims of the flood. Uh, Halsey's also a victim, uh, but her fate remains unknown. Parangoski, I have no idea how she would get away from that. And Liara seemingly, you know, is bitten or infected. And so she's she kind of had her goodbye scene. So the, these two characters, like, we we talked about Liara in the commentary episode that that really moved us and it was pretty moving and and sad and all the emotional feels and motivation for Soren. Were there any sort of feelings towards Parangoski at all when you watched the episode? Um, I'm okay with her. Get, see, it's, it's funny, right? Because I wasn't. I'm not the most okay with Halsey getting infected, but I'm okay with Parangoski getting <laughs> infected. Like I think yeah. that Parangoski is purely a extended lore character she's not in any of the games right so we can kind of play with her a little bit more as far as like what we're gonna expect from the main story because she's not as much of a core character as halsey i would say she's still important um but i think you can more easily dispose of her than halsey because there's less of a plot there with her um but that all that to say, I think, you know, seeing her face of horror was great because, you know, here she is. She's been this sort of villain within Oni that we all know from the books and from everything. And, and she was a good character. She played a really good Parangoski, especially in the last few episodes where you saw that she was really not caring about anything besides what she wanted, which I think was great. But seeing her be overrun like that, I definitely had the thought of, like, is she going to become a proto-grave mind like Keys was? And, um, you know, obviously she would be a huge source of information for the Flood to be able to get stuff like information from for about humanity and Earth and, you know... Um, you know, how Keys was kind of being interrogated, but he never let them in, like, that level of of knowledge she would have, I think would be valuable to the flood. So I don't think they would, I don't think the flood would necessarily just kill her and move on. Like, I think she's someone that they could sense has valuable information. So I can imagine her becoming kind of part of the, the, the flood and maybe seeing her again, like maybe Miranda comes across her when she's being rescued by the Sentinels or something like that, that we kind of see her, um, in a more of a flood form and same with with you know with Liara I think it'd be really horrifying to see her come back and to have Soren you know need to kill her as, as a flood combat form or to um, you know Kessler to see his mom like that would be really really horrific and the the the, the, the show does have to be careful I think with like the level of horror that they're going to jump into, especially for non halo fans. Cause there's some people that would love the sci-fi, but hate the horror. And I think that this mm-hmm. episode did just enough that it, it wasn't like, it was scary, but it wasn't like, you know, I don't know. It didn't have, I mean, at least for me, cause I, you know, we know what the flood is. Yeah. It, it wasn't like dead space. No, you know? like it wasn't, it yeah. wasn't that it, it was still kind of Star Trekky. Yeah. But again, I think we were still, for us of us that are Halo fans, we were still like, expecting it. We were ready for the tentacle to jump out. We were ready for that kind of thing. Whereas if you were not a Halo fan and you're just watching this show about Chief and the first season is just Chief with mommy issues trying to figure out what's going <laughs> on. And then season two, we're getting some battle. But then all of a sudden there's like these zombie looking things and you have no prep for that. Like that would be a shock 
and I, I have a few friends of mine that I want to know what their experience was having not seen or played the games at all. Um, cause it does dip its toes into the horror genre. And I think there might be a percentage of people that are not going to like that, but, um, doesn't mean they shouldn't do it. They should still do it, but it just, it might be interesting to see, um, the level to which they're going to continue that kind of graphic part of it in future seasons. Cause maybe this was the test of what did people think of that level of, of graphic horror, right? To kind of prep it well, for next season, but I think Parangoski is in a position to where if they needed to remove her from the story, they're they are able to. Yes. And I and I because I was thinking about this, like what would a Parangoski character continue to do in another season? Because a lot of what she's been doing for season one and season two has been fighting the Covenant, using Spartans at her disposal to fight the Covenant and to get rid of any insubordination and obstacles that are in the way. Right. But now that, like, the shift of the show is not really about the UNSC fighting the Covenant, it's about Master Chief discovering who he is and him fighting for what he believes in, it's almost like, well, then why should we care about the UNSC as much as maybe we did before if it's all about Master Chief and John and Cortana killing aliens and finding out what the halo is and all this other kind of stuff. So to me, it kind of got it. I got a sense that like her arc kind of reached the ends. And I mean, she didn't really have like a character changing moment. Cause she's, she's kind of just like you said, like she's basically a villain. She's an antagonistic, antagonistic character. Mm-hmm. So I feel like her character is kind of at the end of relevance for the show to where just throwing her into the, the flood just kind of is a way to get her out of it. But right. to your point, I think if they were to bring her back, they would need to reintroduce her in a new way and to have her being a grave mind, proto grave mind type of a character that could be a really interesting sort of dynamic that they can play with. And they could have her be kind of omnipresent, talk through other flood forms, to other characters and, Ooh, and kind of like create her to be this, the ultimate, ultimate baddie. And, uh, or they just incorporate those elements with a completely new character because that's you could do kind of anything with the flood. So yeah, so yeah, I I like I like how we're kind of downsizing the characters a little bit because like we there was a moment where like we there was one episode where like we kept cutting from character to character to character and it's just like wow we have so many characters that we have to yeah. like keep track of and it's like you you kind of do need some to be removed and forgotten a little bit and kind of doing their own little things so then we can focus some real time with these other characters to get to know them and and experience things through them so yeah there's been many many plots and this episode did a good job of making them all converge i feel yes all right let's transition to the spartan threes we had a great space battle we had kai and perez and the other spartan threes do the simulation for real and it started off in almost the exact opposite manner where the condor just got completely blown up yeah you you were talking about the spartan threes and just their representation in the show and and all that like uh how did you like this this push and everything that they did this action sequence it's funny i i was watching it with my wife and th- th- this was the only episode of the season that she watched with me but she went are those stormtroopers and i was like no <laughs> and it's funny because like again they do kind of look like stormtroopers in a way but that's fine um i do think that they are more like spartan 3.5s where it's unclear how long some of them have been in training for like we know perez has been like a week but have the rest of them like are they teenagers that were taken as children by Ackerson 20 years ago like in the books or are they all older when they're recruited like that part of it is a bit unclear as far as the timeline is concerned but yeah it's ambiguous yeah and that's and that's you know it is what it is but Ackerson says that this is his, his his life's work so it makes us think that there's some history there that's beyond what we see in um in the show but um yeah i think i think seeing kai with the spartan threes i've seen this online a few times and i think we touched on it a little bit before we started to, to record but 
I think it's 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 nice to have Kai, um, you know, having that relationship with the Spartan Threes. I just don't know if she has earned the level of closeness that the show seems to think that they have. Because yeah, like, and again, I wish there was timestamps on every episode, but it's been a very short amount of time that Kai's been with them, and it's not like twenty years with Kurt. So I think it's it's not as not as impactful that she's like willing to die for them like it's still heroic it's still self-sacrificing and all that but i just i don't think it would i think it it hits less hard knowing that she's only been with them for a short period of time but i think seeing them battle together like the the action sequences were awesome um i think when they were on the covenant ship i do wish the covenant ship had been it's again a minor little thing but i wish it had been more purple like i think it was very like yeah I, gray. I, I made that note as well but i think if it was like purple it would have felt a bit more covenanty being on that ship um but i definitely do uh I, I, like i said the needler dual wielding was awesome i like the covenant carbine um i wish we had seen kai do a little bit more spartany things because she seemed to just kind of always be on her back leg um falling back constantly with the spartan threes but seeing chief come in that moment and you know all the flying through space shots were just so so good like they just looked so good there were so many moments in season (laughs) one where i just was like cringy like that kind of uncanny valley or you know just uh, like this isn't right i don't know right but this season i would say there was very few moments where i felt that way and i think that that just speaks to the art style and the shooting style and the special and visual effects like i think i think they just did a really really good job of that this season and um there was never a moment where it didn't seem real like it just it all was shot very very well and um yeah, I think they did a, a really good job with the space stuff. Like the sound effects, how it's all like super quiet when she's floating through space, like bumping into her dead comrades on the way. Like, I, yeah, the whole that whole scene was. I couldn't have asked for much more out of that. I think. Yeah, it was very well done. It was very like I think necessary. I mean, you would expect, you know, the season finale to kind of throw a lot of money and special effects and action sequences in a show like this. So. They definitely delivered on that front, and and yeah, I we obviously want more of it because we, you know, that that's the part of the show that, or part of the game, that we are really drawn to, and it's exciting and all that, and to see that represent, uh, represented is just awesome. So, uh, I agree that like Kai could have, or we could have seen Kai maybe with the Spartans longer or there's a bit more of a time jump that kind of happens. It's it's hard because of the way the show is is put together that you don't really have a time jump. I mean, I guess you just could have, and if they maybe had a title card that illustrated that a little bit more clearly, but... Yeah, I think it's kind of hard because I think they probably thought of the whole Kai being Kurt thing. Like, I don't think they could have... Because again, in the in the in the lore, Kurt was taken like twenty years ago, right? When you get to the time of Reach, so they couldn't do that because they already had Kai and Silver Team in the current day. So you couldn't really just like rewrite it that she's been with them for twenty years. Like I, they, I get that they they did as well as they could with the timeline that that they that they had, and that was still good to kind of call back to those kind of plot lines and tropes. But um, yeah. I think that's what I would say about that, that they did about as well as they could have with wanting to replicate some of those things while Mm -hmm. being constrained by the timeline that already existed from season one. Yeah, it still left me emotionally attached to Kai. I mean, just because we've seen her go through so much over these last two seasons and I was, you know, fighting to not want her to get killed. And I still think it's a bit open ended. They do have a beautiful final shot of her floating in space. So, like, we'll see what, what happens. But, you know, plenty of Spartans survive crazy things. So, you never know. And you have Perez as well, who survived with a very critical injury. And I want to see more of her. I think she's had a great character arc over the season. And you definitely see her attachment to Kai at the end there when she runs to the to the 
cockpit of the condor and sees her sacrifice so it's uh, it'll be interesting to see how that moment kind of compounds on her going forward and how that might instill some more responsibility or determination to continue fighting and continue pressing into later seasons so it's uh yeah i I liked how that whole sequence kind of concluded i guess like we got the action bits we got the foreshadowing in the other episode but then like the aftermath of it all still felt very satisfying yes felt with uh with kai and perez in particular yeah and now that i think of it like i think we've always thought of kai as being kind of the kurt figure um definitely i think you could make a comparison to George from Halo Reach where he's, you know, sacrificing himself to blow up the supercarrier. I think that's an interesting parallel. But what just came across my mind too was to Samuel from the Fall of Reach book. Because Yes. Right? Like she stayed behind, she knew what she was doing, she sacrificed herself. Um, Chief kind of, you know, they were teammates and Chief left her, you know, to do what she needed to do. I think that would be an interesting parallel as well. But also to Samuel to Perez, because in the books, I'm pretty sure Samuel, like, th- at this time, I think that their yeah. their armor wasn't perfect. So mm-hmm. their armor, his armor got broken and they, they, and they couldn't patch it. And that's why he couldn't exfil. That's exactly right. And yeah. then Perez, they could. So that's just interesting comparison to... Yeah, and it kind of, I mean, you kind of see this underlying thread between all of these Spartan sacrifices that they're getting thrown in these impossible circumstances, and at some point, something's got to give, and the, the, and that's just what they do. Spartans, you know, ne- like, like Kai says, Spartans never die, but I guess they do, but it's not that they die, it's just that they, they continue fighting, and they, they go to their last breath, and they give everything that they have. Um, as opposed to just kind of cannon fodder and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I know very, very great heroism in this episode. And I, I'm curious to see who, who continues on and, and what they push through and what they go through and the next obstacles that they have to face specifically yep. with Perez, but you know, if Kai or whomever, yeah. Um, so then at the last 15 or 20 minutes, we land on the halo. Woo! Woo! (laughs) It's about time. (laughs) Yeah. So it's about time. You know, we're 45 minutes into our episode and we finally got to the halo. So, um, yeah, we have, we talked about it on the commentary. We think it's Iceland that the filming crew went to film at and get these beautiful shots and throw some vis effects to give it the halo effect, if you will. And I, I think, I mean, even when they first revealed the halo in season one, and you know, the artifact kind of visual mental transportation was still very like ethereal and and visually stunning. And now that we're like actually there, like it, it feels like installation four. It feels like installation installation seven, and and five. The one that we've the ones that we've been on, like it. I can't wait to see more of this environment and even the forerunner architecture that they incorporated. I, I mean, it looks like it can be straight out of the game. Like it, it's a, it's unique to the show, I would say, or maybe it looks a little bit reminiscent of like halo wars that kind of like of what I made the visual comparison with, but like it's, it's giving all those same feels it's familiar, but different. And I'm, I'm all for it. And I can't wait to see what more and we, we got a glimpse of when the when the monitor flew away in the distance and the blue light sort of emitted and we just see this long cavern this long corridor of the forerunner structure and it's just like oh man that's all the feels that's what i want to see more of and that's the the cool environments that we've been playing for the last 20 years mm-hmm no, I think being on the Halo certainly feels awesome. And if most of the next season is on the Halo, I would not be mad at all. I did just look up where it was filmed. It's actually filmed in Italy. Italy? Italy. I know. Lago del wow. Predil. Yeah, I just I looked it up. Because there, there was a post on the Paramount Halo's uh, Facebook page that talked about how it's not CCGI. It's really just that pretty. And they named the name of, the, of that lake. And it's in Italy. So... 
That's interesting. Wow. But yeah, no, I definitely agree. Like, I think uh, the fact that I think most of the other Halo shots that we've had so far with those kind of dreamlike sequences have pretty much probably all been CGI. Um, so to really see like a physical environment that doesn't look made up, I think was really rewarding because I was worried that it was just always all going to be CGI because, you know, that's how it had been so far. But I definitely think being there and seeing the, the Forerunner architecture and the spires and all of that um, with the music when you looked up at the ring, like, yeah, it felt like we we just got out of the, what was it, the Bumblebee that you crash in and Halo CE and you're getting out looking around for the first time. Like, it definitely felt like that. And for the most part, Chief kept his helmet on on the ring. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I thought that was nice too because there were so many actually moments that you can see things in his visor. And, and you can see, oh, like, yes. you can see the Arbiter Rive running at him. When he's in space, you can see the Halo ring in his visor. Like, I think that those little things, it, it's just so perfect. Like, it's cinematic, it's meaningful. Um, and just seeing, I think Chief's armor in this season is a big step up as well. I will say that from like a props per perspective, like costume design. Like, I think they just look better than season one. Um, so, yeah, great to see him there. And yeah. his fight with the Arbiter was, you know, um, just awesome. And, and I think it opens up the door for there to be a new Arbiter um, moving forward. And now that we know kind of what an Arbiter is, um, yeah, I think it's definitely, uh, definitely a cool set piece to be. And I'm sure it was awesome to film there, too. Um, just a beautiful, beautiful environment. It must have been really surreal for like someone like Kiki Wolfkill or anyone else on set that had to that's a fan of the games to kind of see that environment actually being like filmable. Like, you know, yeah. like I just imagine like, you know, th- that set of them with the forerunner structures like I'm sure some of that like the like the um repository or the like where they press their hand against to that that console like that I'm sure was a physical element that existed in the space. And so to see the beauty of Italy and, and have that incorporated in there, it must've been just so surreal to kind of see it in, in real life. So that's, that's just so cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with chief's broken helmet, because like, <laughs> I don't really think he would be wearing that. It'd be just so weird if he wore that, constantly where we only see one eye like i mean it was a cool visual stinger at the end there but I, I, i'm curious how they're gonna deal with that going forward Fl- flood infection form just jun- jumps at his open yeah eye. <laughs> right so but uh who knows we'll, we'll see what that becomes yeah it's very like i think the arbiters fight with chief like i've seen the comparison made online a lot to the chief's fight with Locke in halo five oh, okay with like the like you know chief getting his butt handed to him and getting punched and like kind of you know the hand-to-hand combat because we don't see we see a lot of like gunplay and stuff like that with the chief in the games but not that much hand-to-hand combat i would say um a little bit at the start of infinite with atriox and stuff like that but um yeah definitely seeing you know the chief fight the arbiter and 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 doing that like it was it was a good fight and it was long enough it wasn't too long it wasn't too short it was it was a good fight it had the, the you know the swords in it had the grapple shot um i thought it was it was a satisfying end to that arbiter's plot because i think we've been waiting for that moment and i think seeing that actually happen and um yeah, I, I still don't understand Maki, but I don't know if we're meant to. Also, how can we finish this entire season and get no explanation of how she didn't die last season? I'll just say that now. Because yeah. I was waiting for like a one minute explanation of that in this episode being like, this is how I'm still here or like whatever. But no, like we that's just going to be retconned and we're just going to move on. And yeah, like I, <laughs> I wish there was something. I wonder if there's a shot that we might have missed in season one where an elite goes to pick her up or something. But like I, I was expecting because the Arbiter has such this connection, like her and the Arbiter. Like I was curious if like maybe the Arbiter would say like I saved you 
so to speak, and like kind of alluded that like it was him who believes in her as the blessed one saved her at the at that battle at the end of season one, and that's why they're they're on this quest of redemption. It's like well, both of them, you know, survived that encounter. Now the two of them need to get the artifacts back, or else oh, they will be mm-hmm. shamed and all that kind of stuff. And that yeah. that to me makes the most sense narratively, but it. Unless I missed something, it wasn't really conveyed. I, I had to fill in the spaces with my head cannon to kind of make that work. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, but I I mean but again, like why why do we need that to be explained to us at the end of the season? Like I why know. not i I think I mentioned this that like we should have seen McKee from the beginning. Like if 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 we had her steal the artifact at the end of season, episode one or two and then the next episode her and the arbiter are talking and we get some we get some stakes we get some emotion we get some character and then we understand why they're doing what they're doing and then we get the battle of reach instead of her just looking off at chief and being like oh hey i'm here and then disappears in the shadows like it's just <laughs> i it still love do you. anything you know what i mean i still yeah, yeah i still love you uh, but i have to go there's the whole thing where she's like if i touch the artifact nothing happens i don't see him and it yeah like, like, and it's like uh, like what 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 is your what is your beef here like yeah the one thing that i did kind of recognize only when i rewatched thermopylae for the second time was the fact that she got like she branded herself as an arbiter right um with, with that thing and it kind of paralleled it, i noticed it because when she kind of you know um, pulls down the top of her outfit to brand herself on her back. There's the scars that the UNSC gave her. Yeah. And so she's now like making a new scar, but she's choosing it and she's like aligning herself with the covenant. I thought that was an interesting parallel. Yeah. No, that's a good parallel. I didn't put the, those two together. Right. I just, I just agree with her branding herself with the mark of shame because she carries guilt and shame and dishonor yeah. that she wants to overcome. But again, we kind of like it, it just wasn't displayed. No. But I see what they were doing. Similar to Quan, I want I want to care more, but I can't because you're not giving me enough information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no. I'm curious uh, as ever to see how she kind of assumes some sort of god complex or antagonistic goal in season three, because I feel like her her journey, like Quan's, like you said, is a little rocky. And kind of goes up and down, up and down, and or bumpy, I guess. It's a bumpy road, a bumpy arc, and we get to where we get, so. Or could she just become, like, could, could she now fill the role of the Arbiter from the games? That she's, like, her and Chief become aligned in their fight against the Flood, and now... Do you know what I mean? Like, could yeah, but like, what what can she really do? You know, like know. she she's just a random human that is a blessed one like you know and it doesn't have the backing of the covenant really anymore you know she she didn't control the hunter worms when she invaded that ship but she was you know in alliance with them so the hunter worms killed all the gladstone or whatever that ship called was called yeah but like she doesn't have that type of influence over the covenant anymore so like and if she's in opposition with uh chief like the only thing she really could do, I guess, is have any sort of influence over the monitor. And maybe she has a an army of sentinels that she uses. Or she aligns herself with the Flood, and then now she does things with the Flood. So, like, it, it's really unclear kind of what her overall yeah. goal is. Because she wants to activate the ring and all that, but, again, she's not a force that is unstoppable. She literally can get shot. Like... <laughs> you know yeah. yeah she's not she doesn't have a physical prowess or you know weapons training she, sh- she should talk to kwan maybe kwan can train mamaki on how to be a, a ninja assassin because you know yeah actually kwan yeah, learned that so. overnight that's so. what we're missing the <laughs> kwan maki buddy cop there you go and then you make it a romance and we're back to season one so there we go <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> oh man but no i Mickey definitely knows what the lady's like <laughs> okay that's another thing i wish there was johnson somewhere too we'll get to that with season three predictions but that would be cool i am so happy there's not johnson i <laughs> why 
the the <laughs> moment you introduce Johnson, the moment the fan base criticizes it, and I it, know that's true. It, it's just like I would just rather it just only exists. <laughs> like you can't top season or Halo Two Johnson. No, Halo Two Johnson is so good. Halo Three Johnson is almost as good, but, but like, and then <laughs> Fall or Contact Harvest Johnson is so good in the books. Like he is such a great character, but like he has such a unique voice that like I don't know. Yeah, he's definitely uh definitely a character that would be interesting one to introduce from a cultural perspective for sure for. Yeah, just, yeah, interesting yeah. guy. But I think it would be interesting to have a human-like character like him that can accompany Chief, because I think that, that whether that, that's Miranda or Perez or someone else, I think Chief could benefit from having a, a human companion. I agree with that. And, you know, so, someone like the, what's his, uh, S? The, the pilot, Fernando Esparza. Yeah, Esparza, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, some, yeah, someone like that. Yeah, you kind of a human character that can be with him. No, I, I, I agree. And he, they, they could very well do Johnson, but like, John, like Johnson's just one of those elements of the canon that you just can't change. Like you, no, you need Johnson to be Johnson. Like, and if they can do that, great. But I don't have yeah. the faith that they need to do it because I don't think there's really an element to the show that is as close to a one-on-one core canon silver timeline comparison that you, it would need to be. Yeah, yes, that's, that's interesting. But yeah, no idea. Arangoski and Halsey, I think, are close. Yes, but they're not. They're not quite one-to-one. But they're 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 probably the closest. Yeah, yeah, so. agreed. All right, so let's let's chat about the monitor real quick, and then we'll start wrapping things up. Uh, to kind of dive a little bit into the Halo Waypoint article, the Silver Debrief that releases each each week, uh, Alex Waitford talks about the monitor and what the monitor, what monitors are, and kind of how they've come to being and and things. But they, he doesn't explicitly say that this monitor is three four three Guilty Spark. All he says is that we're first introduced to monitors all the way back in Halo Combat Evolved, where we encountered 343 Guilty Spark, the monitor of Alpha Halo. And what they also... uh, Oh, then he says, since then, we've met many more throughout the games, including Penitent Tangent on Delta Halo, Exuberant Witness on the Shield World of Genesis, and Despondent Pyre on Zeta Halo. So, I feel like this monitor and even this ring is not necessarily installation 04 and not necessarily 343 guilty spark i feel like it's just the silver timeline halo ring and the silver timeline monitor and Mm -hmm. i'm perfectly okay with that it would have been um it would have been so much more amazing if it was tim dadabo because he is an amazing human being but it is what it is yeah, I think that's interesting. I think one of the thoughts that comes to my mind is you said, is this not Insulation 04? And could they be amalgamating Alpha Halo and Delta Halo? Like, could they be trying to, like, do that? And then because you're doing that, you can't make it one or the other. You just need to have a monitor that it would be kind of responsible for both, right? But I think, depending upon the story they want to tell, but because they are putting all the Halo canon events in a blender and, and pouring it into a, the Halo TV show <laughs> smoothie. Like, <laughs> they they very well could do that. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this or if it was Aaron or someone else on a different episode, but I think we said that, like, what if they told the events of CE and Halo 2 kind of together to kind of get you yeah. to the arc or whatever. Maybe they don't even talk about the arc in the Halo TV show, but I feel like for the the events that need to unfold is that we need to discover what halo is and why it was built and what it's used for and there needs to be a risk of it being activated and it's like that that in a nutshell is what ce and halo 2 happen on on delta halo and on alpha halo so that's basically what's going to happen to to a degree 
And I think they'll just make whatever story that, that fits in the world of the TV show as opposed to retelling the events of CE right. and retelling the events of Halo 2 or even retelling the events of Infinite. Like, may, like I was actually really on board with Tom's theory that part of the ring would get destroyed and then now they kind of retell Infinite a little bit. But, like, I, I also believe that they're not going to just retell one of the stories. They're going to reimagine the story because it's a silver timeline it's the tv show yeah so i feel like this is a ring and i think you need to have the array to give the scale of the galaxy and they will just discover that oh shit there's six other rings well this one's dangerous imagine all seven yeah and then will we go to the other ones probably not because i don't think you really need to if they're all the same yeah and the, and the confines of the tv show yeah interesting could they be doing you know how at the end of infinite the weapon is like i want to pick my own name and she's like is it okay and chief just nods and we never actually know what she chooses could it be like (laughs) three four three being like all right we want to gauge if people are going to be okay if this is three four three guilty spark and we're just going to see what the response is. And then depending on the response, next season we'll name him. Because <laughs> I feel like with... That's, it, yeah. Because I feel like with Infinite, it was like a, the same kind of thing of like, hey, would people be mad if we called her Cortana? Or do they want her to be something else? So we're just going to not commit, let the fan base react, and then go with whatever is the popular opinion for in the next installment, That's, right? But... Yeah. Yeah. I like that theory. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I, like I said before, I would be fine if it's not Tim DeDabo, but make it sound like a monitor, please. Like that would, that <laughs> like, like <laughs> I was watching it with, uh, with my dad for the first time. He, he, my dad, he's the one that got me into Halo. And so we, we, we always watch the show together and we watched the last episode and it finished and he was like, not in a good mood after because it wasn't tim to dabbo or it didn't sound like three, oh four, three. wow he was like you know of all the things that you could do like you know there's many people who could voice c3po or many people that could voice kermit the frog like you don't always need the same voice actor but you could have made it sound closer um and i think i think he's probably right that it did just sound like a human voice talking but every monitor that we see in the games always sounds slightly robotic and they could have just added a filter to his voice that made him sound robotic and made everyone feel a lot better, I think. But Yeah, and I feel like they might have made that choice to hide the fact that he was a monitor and keep it am- ambiguous right. since that's yeah. why since that's how they did those flash, the flash forwards. forwards. But again, yeah. it's like that's that's another like element of why the flash forwards are not really benefiting the story. So. It wouldn't. Yeah, it didn't give me any, any, anything more. Like I, it, I wasn't actively thinking about it throughout the episode just because I saw it first. I would have been fine if it was just at the end. Like that would have been. It would have been the equal same thing. Like I wouldn't have added much. But, um, yeah, no. But I, I think, I think having an unnamed monitor for now is fine, and it gives them time to think about where they would like to go and uh, i'm just very curious like did they ask tim to dabo and there wasn't an interest or did they just choose someone else like i'd I'd be curious right but yeah that that could be a whole slew of things yeah there could have been contracts there could have been yeah it could have been pricing although i doubt it was about they i doubt they couldn't afford him but yeah yeah there's there's a whole slew of of reasons of why it could not be him and this is just what it is and maybe it will be next season right because they changed cortana's look this is this season so maybe next season they do commit and they bring him in right like it's not out of the question or maybe he's an easter egg and that monitor is talking to another monitor for a brief moment and that one is tim dadabo for that one little scene and it's like this is a sub monitor (laughs) you know yeah it's like it's like how um Peter Dinklage did the voice of the ghost in in Destiny 1, but because of scheduling conflicts and probably price and other things, they recasted him as Nolan North, and then now Nolan North is the voice of your ghost in the Destiny games. So, like, it, yeah. it, could, be, it could be something like that. I mean, it could really be, you know, a dozen different things. Yeah. So, but... Anyway... Well, I think that hits 
think all the topics that we wanted to discuss for this episode. We have a few more minutes left, I think, before we hit our time. I want to hit you with this closing question, Nathan, before we dive into our kind of post-season episodes for the remainder of Halo TV Plus Season 2. But uh, what do you want from the next season? Like, what what do you think the overall direction of Season 3 should be, or what do you kind of want out of it? I think, you know, continuing the trajectory that we're on is really all that I would ask for. Like, I think Season 1, it was not bad, but it wasn't like, ah, this is Halo, right? This season, every episode, as much as there was some kind of lulls, I think every episode it started to feel a little bit more like Halo. There's more elements, like more Forerunner stuff, more Flood stuff, um, you know, more scenes on Covenant ships, like things that are familiar, I think have been more and more prominent. And I just want that to continue, right? Like I want more scenes on the halo i want more flood i want more you know i would love to, to see more covenant assets like race and ghosts and banshees and grunts and hunters like i want the full uh, the full kind of picture um because this season we largely got you know elites a couple grunts in that episode and a single brute but i would love to see more diversity in in the amount of the covenant things that we're seeing um, I, I just wanted to continue to, to tell the story of, of Halo and to do that in a way that's engaging and maintains its current course of kind of correcting some of the things that they did in season one that were just not even uncanny as a Halo fan, but just like wasn't great as far as the, the, the you know, the lines and the plot and just you know the level of engagement the overall like production yeah, value yeah i think i think if they just continue that and they learn from hopefully you know I, I what i really hope is that it does get renewed and i'm hopeful that people that didn't enjoy season one give season two a chance now that it's all out um i do think that a lot of people maybe were turned off by season one and even with all the promotion for season two, they would kind of go, Ugh, I don't know. Like people are, are very particular with their choice of media. And I just, I, I do hope that this season, like the sort of word gets out that it is a good show that it, people do choose to watch it and um, that they do kind of give the series enough of a budget to do well in the next season if they get renewed. So um yeah, those are kind of my thoughts. I just, you know, seeing more Chief and Cortana, seeing, you know, more Flood on the ring, um, just classic things that you would expect to see. It almost feels like you could have just started watching in this season and really not missed much from season one. And I, I think I think just continuing to, to build on what this season has done um, and kind of bring us into what we're most familiar with it being Halo I think it's on the right track. It just needs to keep the momentum. Well, all right. Well, there you have it. What Nathan would like from season three. I mean, I basically agree. Um, I mean, more Halo is always better Halo, I guess. is a weird way to say it. Uh, Yeah, I I agree that season two definitely feels more Halo than season one did. Uh, I mean, I think I gave like a general like five or six out of 10 to the first season because there was a lot that I liked and a lot that just didn't, I just didn't like. It's kind of grown on me a little bit more. But season two, I think, is a a worthy, you know, uh, second season for the show. And it, it, yeah, definitely feels more Halo. And now that the flood is here, it's, it's like, yeah, we're like in these stories and with these characters. And I, I just want more that comes out of it hopefully we don't have to wait two years again i mean we had a actor and a writer strike that took place in that two-year time frame but hopefully we get something before 2026 but we'll see what what happens on that front yeah absolutely i would agree i think i would if i had to rate this season i'd probably give it a 7.5 to an 8 that's probably where i would put it nice better than season one for for sure but definitely things that we can keep doing better they've made really good improvements from their production value of season one to their you know really a production direction 
into season two. So, well, all right. I think that'll do it for our analysis episode. Nathan, thank you so much for joining me again and for being on the show. Yeah, it's been great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. All of season one and season two are on Paramount Plus. So if you wanted to check that out, you can rewatch, binge watch. I think I need to do a a binge over the next couple of days. Uh, if you're interested, Alex Waitford releases his silver debriefing blogs, like I mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, it talks a little bit about the monitor, but it does recap the episode, and he kind of provides some little bit more insight into certain things. So you can check that out over on Halo Waypoint. I will have a few more episodes of Halo TV Plus over the next two or three weeks. Um, I have some personal things I need to get to during the next few weeks, but we want to do a season two recap. We want to do a season three predictions. I might have another guest uh, or some community episodes sprinkled in. Uh, So don't go away and stick around. We have a little bit more content headed your way to our listeners. So look out for that over the coming weeks. And like I also mentioned, Evolved hosts other podcasts. So once this show kind of goes into uh, hibernation, if you will, for a little while, you can check out our other shows that Evolved produces. And you can find all of those on our website, uh, haloevolved.com or .co or po- halopodcast.com. Don't forget to check us out on our social media Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Once again, another special shout out to all of our patrons for supporting Evolved and making all of the shows possible. Head over to patreon.com slash Halo Evolved to learn more. If you like this show, rate us and leave us a review. I greatly appreciate all the feedback that we receive to improve and tweak the quality of the show. And if you want to leave an email, you can email us at podcastevolved at gmail.com or a Google voice message on our Google number at 205 Evolve, which is 205-386-5833. And with that, I have been your host, Oren, and until next time, Evolved. Evolved.